Indeed. <laughs> Indeed it is. Here's the thing. There's more. That much we know. There is more detail, more information about the president's efforts to lean on a foreign leader for personal political gain. CNN has learned that a second whistleblower from the intelligence community has come forward with what we are told is first-hand knowledge about the phone call between President Trump and the president of Ukraine. This undercuts the arguments from some Republicans who demean the first whistleblower's claims as hearsay. Also breaking overnight, a group of 90 former national security officials who served under both Republican and Democratic presidents, they issued an open letter of support for the initial whistleblower saying, quote, a responsible whistleblower makes all Americans safer by ensuring that serious wrongdoing can be investigated and addressed, thus advancing the cause of national security to which we have devoted our careers. Being a responsible whistleblower means that, by law, one is protected from certain egregious forms of retaliation. Former Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel, former CIA Director Michael Hayden, are among those who signed this letter. Some major developments on that front, also major developments breaking overnight. A significant foreign policy move by the Trump administration. U.S. troops are right now withdrawing from northern Syria, clearing the way for Turkey to invade the region and abandoning Kurdish fighters who fought alongside the U.S. to defeat ISIS. But let's begin with our coverage with CNN's Suzanne Malvo, who was live on Capitol Hill. Good morning, Suzanne. Hey, good morning, Bianca and John. Well, of course, the impeachment process is now moving at lightning speed as Democrats present their case, a case that they believe is getting stronger by the day now that they not have just one whistleblower, but two come forward. A second whistleblower coming forward, intensifying the accusations President Trump pressured Ukraine to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden and his son. Their attorney telling CNN this whistleblower works in the intelligence community, has first-hand knowledge supporting claims made in the first whistleblower's complaint, and has already been interviewed by the intelligence community inspector general. People around the president, mm -hmm. professionals who are in the Oval Office, who are uh, in the Situation Room, are watching what is happening and are finally saying, my God, this cannot happen anymore, and they are coming forward. The White House continues to spin. Writing in a statement, it doesn't matter how many people decide to call themselves whistleblowers about the same telephone call, a call the president already made public. It doesn't change the fact that he has done nothing wrong. But the White House transcript summary of that call shows President Trump repeatedly pressuring Ukraine's new leader to investigate his rival. Trump feels confident he can survive an impeachment vote if it goes to the Senate. They have no choice. They have to follow their leadership. And then we'll get it to the Senate and we're going to win. The Republicans have been very unified. But he's facing harsh criticism from some Republican senators after this. China should start an investigation into the Bidens. Senator Susan Collins joining Mitt Romney and Ben Sass in rebuking the president's comment. It's completely inappropriate. Romney taking it a step further, calling the president's China request brazen, wrong and appalling sparking Trump's fury on Twitter, assailing the former GOP presidential nominee's lack of loyalty by writing, the Democrats are lucky that they don't have any Mitt Romney types. They may be lousy politicians, but they stick together. Most Republican lawmakers falling in line. Remember mm. Kavanaugh, it started with one complaint that wound up being unverifiable. This is Kavanaugh all over again. Do you not trust Trump, the Ameri Trump, do you not Trump's trust the FBI? You don't trust the CIA? No, I, I'm just no, very confused here. Absolutely you don't trust not. either after of Peter those Strzok entities. Page, okay. After, after James Comey, you believe the uh, FBI Peter, and Peter the CIA, Strzok, John Brennan, these no, I don't agencies. trust any of these guys in the Obama okay. administration. I don't trust any of them. You don't trust them now. You trust them now. No, I, I didn't trust them back then. Some Democrats claiming their Republican colleagues are treating Trump like he's a dictator. This is wild, the lengths to which Republicans are going to try to avoid being criticized by this president. And it's going to be another incredibly busy week here on Capitol Hill as two more diplomats will be deposed to the impeachment House committees behind closed doors. We're talking about tomorrow. That is the U.S. ambassador to the European Union. And then on Friday, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, who was abruptly recalled in May. John? What stories does she have to tell? Much mm -hmm. more on all these developments, Suzanne. Thank you very much. Just ahead, first-hand knowledge about President Trump's dealings with Ukraine. The phone call where he leaned on the Ukrainian president to dig up dirt on a political opponent. This all comes as two more diplomats will answer questions to Congress this week. Joining us now, CNN political correspondent Abby Phillip and CNN legal analyst Ellie Honig. Ellie, 
here's the thing. So we have this second whistleblower who has come forward. What more can this person add to the picture, given that we have a transcript, albeit you know a rough transcript of the phone call where President Trump leans on the Ukrainian leader? We have text messages where there are diplomats talking about quid pro quos. So what does this second whistleblower add? I agree with you. We already have quite a bit to go on. But generally speaking, more whistleblowers is more problems for Donald Trump. It's more leads for investigators to follow up on. What the main thing that whistleblowers do is point investigators. Look here, look there. Now, the one whistleblower already led to this devastating evidence. Who knows where this second whistleblower goes? The main thing we do know is this person has firsthand evidence. So he or she may have even more leads for investigators to follow up on. And I think Trump and his people are really feeling the heat. And you can tell because they're launching this attack the messenger campaign. They're going after the whistleblower. And I've seen this happen. When the evidence starts to get really strong, in my experience as a prosecutor, that's when the personal attacks start flying. That's when the distraction starts happening. We're seeing that happen now, but everyone needs to focus. Forget about the attacks on the whistleblower. Look at the actual evidence, the calls, the documents. That's what's going to make the case right. here. So, so, Abby, let me ask you, what is the White House's response to this now? Clearly, the president first said that the, the initial whistleblower wasn't there, is not credible. This whistleblower has firsthand knowledge, was uh, assumably one of the, the six people that were in the room to witness the call. What is the White House's take now? Well, this, uh, the press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, uh, claimed in a statement that the second whistleblower doesn't matter because the president did nothing wrong in the first place. What's interesting about that is that that's an argument, actually, that very few people around the president in, in terms of lawmakers in Congress are even willing to make. They're not even touching the substance of what President Trump uh, did on that call or said on that call. Uh, they're uh, pivoting to this idea that there is some kind of vast conspiracy theory centered on Ukraine, that um, where all the answers about what happened in the 2016 uh, election are, uh, I, the White House is just trying to ignore the facts here uh, by focusing on the whistleblower, suggesting that these claims are not valid because somehow uh, these individuals don't have direct enough knowledge. We'll find out if that's the case. If this second person really does have more direct knowledge, I really do think it, it um, makes it much harder for that argument to be made. And, and critically, they can fill in some of the blanks about what are some of these other conversations that were happening within the administration that were alluded to in the text message exchanges that were released last week. They suggest that there were a lot of other conversations happening around this issue. Does this second whistleblower know more about that? I think it will add more meat to the bones of uh, the already pretty damning uh, report that we have and the, the information that we have coming out of these people who have testified so far. We're going to have a chance to talk about the different Republican responses we've seen over the last few days. But there is one I'd like to home in on, if I can, for a second. And that comes from Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, who is the chair, the chair, I believe, of the Senate Homeland uh, Security Committee, which means that one of his jobs would be to keep elections safe right. going forward. I Depending want on our U.S. intelligence to do that. Exactly. Listen to him attack the FBI and the CIA here. I just want the truth. The American people want so the truth. So do you not trust Certainly the Ameri President do you not Trump's trust the FBI? You don't trust the CIA? No, I, I'm just no, very confused here. Absolutely you don't trust not. either after of Peter those Strzok agencies. And Lisa Page? Okay. After, after James Comey? You believe the uh, FBI Peter, and Peter the CIA? Strzok, John Brennan? No, I don't agencies? trust any of these guys in the Obama okay. administration. I don't trust any of them. You don't trust them now? Do you trust them now? No, I, I didn't trust them back then. So this is the guy, Ellie, one of the guys who we're counting on to keep the 2020 election safe. And he's refusing to accept, it sounds like, all the evidence from Robert Mueller and out there that Russia attacked the 2016 election. It's mind-boggling, and it's really just deep state conspiracy stuff, but it's coming from inside the government, the people responsible for keeping us safe from this kind of attack. And it's really incredible to see. And Abby used the phrase pivot. I mean, we've never seen so much pivoting from straightforward questions as we have the last couple of weeks. Do you think it's okay what the president does on that call? to talk to Ukraine and ask, you can't debate this fact. The president got on the phone, asked the president of Ukraine to investigate an American citizen, his political opponent, period. There's room for debate about why and how it went down and what the motives were, but that fact is unavoidable. And you see right there, the, the dilemma that Republicans are facing and are going to face when they have to vote on this in Congress. Well, and quickly, if I could just add, this seems to be a new narrative. It's not what the, the former narrative was, which is we didn't trust the old leadership, right, in intelligence. He's now stating that he doesn't trust current leadership 
Well, Gina is- Haspel, Chris Ray, I, yeah. I, I'm sure they have they have responses to this too. All right, guys, stand by if you will. Much more to discuss, but we do want to get to the breaking news overnight: a major shift in U.S. foreign policy. The White House announced U.S. troops are moving out of northern Syria, which would allow Turkey to invade the region. And most importantly, and this is what we need to focus on, the move essentially abandons U.S.-backed Kurdish forces in the fight against ISIS. CNN's Barbara Starr live at the Pentagon with the breaking details here, Barbara. The U.S. fought alongside these Kurdish allies to defeat ISIS, at least their land holdings in Syria. And now it seems as if the U.S. is hanging them out to dry. Well, right now, the president is, uh, President Trump is saying U.S. troops are leaving this area. The first images emerging, you see them there, a U.S. convoy pulling out the American flag there at their base near the border, and they are moving back. In fact, the White House overnight confirming this in a statement, partially saying that uh, the U.S. forces having defeated the ISIS territorial caliphate will no longer be in the immediate area. What is really happening here? Turkey says it's going to cross the border and try and move these Kurdish forces out. Now the U.S. saying these forces were supported only, of course, to fight ISIS. So now saying that they will move out U.S. forces pulling back. This leaves the Kurdish forces on their own. It is actually a loss for President Trump. He has been unable to convince the Turkish leader, a NATO ally, not to move into northern Syria. And overnight, it appears the Turks are very determined to do this. It also opens the door for Iran and Russia to exert their influence in the area. But there is an even bigger nightmare scenario, if you can believe it. U.S. military officials are very deeply worried this morning that more of these Kurdish fighters who right now are guarding thousands thousands of ISIS detainees, they will leave their positions to go north to fight the Turks, and ISIS may be back out on the street. John, Biana. That's right. It's important to note that, that Turkey does view these Kurdish fighters as terrorists. Yep. Barbara Starr, thanks to you. Well, the United Drawing from northern Syria, which clears the way for Turkey to invade the region. And this move essentially abandons the Kurdish fighters who fought alongside American forces in the battle to defeat ISIS. Joining us now is CNN political commentator Joe Lockhart. He was President Clinton's press secretary, including during impeachment. And Joe, I want to read you a comment from Brett McGurk, who was, until December, when he quit the U.S. point person dealing with the war in Syria. He wrote, Donald Trump is not a commander-in-chief. He makes impulsive decisions with no knowledge or deliberation. He sends military personnel into harm's way with no backing. He blusters and then leaves our allies exposed when adversaries call his bluff or he confronts a hard phone call. Just as you wake up this morning, your reaction to this move overnight, and is there anything to the timing of it given the president's domestic political issues? I don't know if there's much to it uh, on the timing domestically, because I think uh, this will be harshly criticized. Uh, We'll see if Republicans can find the will to criticize him. But uh, uh, Ambassador McGurk is exactly right. Uh, You know, this is not a single incident of, oh, I want to pull these troops out. The Kurds have proved over decades to be a bulwark against the influence of Iran and Russia in the region. That's one of the reasons we fought with them, uh, not just against ISIS. We have we have protected them for a very long time, and they protected us, and they have protected our interests, and they have protected our interests. And to stand up and without uh, consulting our allies, without there being a process within the administration for the president to just say we're leaving, um, uh, lay you know sort of uh, uh, will leave them you know viciously exposed. Uh, to the Turks who have been waiting for this moment for, uh, for decades. Uh, and it, it just shows the sort of capriciousness of, uh, and the lack of understanding uh, the president have. And I guess the last point is, is it helps the Russians. And if you look for a commonality in decisions that the president has, has made that don't seem to make sense on their face, is it helps the Russians. And so here's a president who hates to look weak, yet many are questioning why give in to the Turks right now. What leverage do they have over this president, especially given that you say this is a win for Russia? Right. They just purchased Russian military equipment. That's right. Well, listen, I don't know um, to the extent that the Turks may have anything, but I think we do know 
that when the president goes looking for national security advice, he does not trust the people around him. He does not trust the intelligence agencies. He's been through now how many national security advisors. Um, he trusts Vladimir Putin. Uh, and that's, that should scare all of us. Joe, if I can pivot back to the impeachment investigation, Tucker Carlson from Fox TV wrote an interesting op-ed uh, which didn't get as much attention as I think it should have, because I think it might be a roadmap for Republicans in defense of the president. He basically said the president's actions are not defensible, but they're not impeachable. Bad, but not impeachable. How effective could that argument be if they stick to it? Well, we spent a lot of last week of me saying that the Republicans and the president's uh, defenses were not uh, sustainable because facts kept undercutting them. And I think both the president and uh, the Hill now have hit upon something that uh, where they, you know, if that is sustainable, follow me on this. There's echoes of where the Democrats were in 1998, which was, you know, we don't approve of what the president did, but boy, you're sure you're sure not going to turn turn him out of office for this. Now, comparing the two are on its face ridiculous, but. I think that the Republicans can stick with that if they show some discipline. The president, for his part, can stick with, I didn't do anything wrong, as opposed to trying to say, I didn't do it, or trying to say, it's the deep state coming after me. It's a very simple message. I just so, didn't do anything wrong. So you think that can work with the president saying, I didn't do anything wrong, and Republicans sticking to the Tucker Carlson narrative, which is he did something wrong, but it's not impeachable? Well, listen, I think politically you just want to have something you can repeat over and over again. You want to have a message. You want to, you want to try to drive the narrative. This is much better when the, the, than where they were this time last week. The problem for all of this is the revelations that are going to continue to come out of the House investigation. So at some point, the president doesn't have to change his tune, but, the, but Republicans on the Hill might feel the heat of there being too much, and then it's not sustainable to say it doesn't rise to They don't know what's coming next. They don't know what's coming next. All right, Joe, thank you very much. Uh, a, a really interesting story in the world of sports and international relations overnight. The Houston Rockets in a bad... Former President Jimmy Carter says he feels fine after a bad fall yesterday at his Georgia home. The 95-year-old said he lost his footing while getting ready for church and hit his forehead on a sharp edge. Carter explained the injury at an event for Habitat for Humanity in Nashville last night. They took 14 stitches in my forehead and uh, my eyes black, as you notice. But uh, I had a number one priority and that was to come to Nashville to build houses. Is there anyone tougher than yeah. him? The former president got 14 stitches in that bruised eye from the fall, and his wife, Rosalind, will be working with volunteers in Nashville this week to help build 21 homes. And I love that he's wearing a Braves hat with the Braves in yeah. the playoffs. All right, there's been a dramatic development in the case of the Dallas police officer convicted of killing a black man in his own apartment. A key witness in the murder trial has himself been killed. Joshua Brown was shot multiple times in the parking lot of the apartment complex. He testified less than two weeks ago to Amber Geiger's actions after she killed Botham John. CNN's Ed Lavendera live in Dallas with the latest on this. This is incredible, Ed. Good morning, John. Well, this uh, a shooting has uh, sparked a wide range of speculation as to what the motive might have been. But 28-year-old Joshua Brown, that witness uh, in the say. Joshua's, Joshua Brown was shot multiple times in the lower body. Now, there was a wide range of speculation over the weekend uh, that he had been shot in the mouth. Every indication we have at this point is that that is not the case. Uh, the uh, attorney representing the family of Joshua Brown is also the same, one of the same attorneys that was representing both of Jean's family, Lee Merritt. He told us last night that Joshua Brown was shot in November of 2018, so about a year ago. In a, in, a, in a shooting event that had nothing to do with the Botham Jean trial, and that he was wounded in that attack, and that at some point he did worry that that person was, quote, going to come back and finish the job. Now, whether or not all of this is connected to the Botham Jean trial is completely unclear at this point, uh, but that is a shocking development in this story as just a couple of days after uh, the trial ended, uh, this young man murdered here in Dallas. John? All right, Ed, please stay on this for us. All right, surprising developments in the NBA has come forward with what we are told is first-hand information of the claims made by the initial whistleblower about President Trump's dealings with Ukraine. Remember, the phone call where the president leaned on the, the president of Ukraine to dig up dirt on his political rival, Joe Biden. 
Joining us now is Bradley Poliska, a former whistleblower who worked as an investigator in the House Benghazi Committee. Uh, Bradley, thank you so much for being with us this morning. The idea that a second whistleblower, a new person, is apparently coming forward with information that corroborates uh, the claims by the first whistleblower, what does that tell you about the information itself? Uh, yeah, well, I'd first like to thank you for having me on the show. Uh, when I heard about the second whistleblower coming forward, it simply reminded me of when I read the initial complaint, and I had two initial reactions to that. My first one was, this is extremely well written. Uh, and the, the, the second reaction was, this person is very well connected. And if you read the complaint, he's not talking about just one or two people that know about this. He's talking about several people that are aware of uh, what's going on. Having and strength so, in numbers, what does it do to the, to the credibility of these complaints? So it's either going to come down to, this would be dichotomous in my opinion, either several people are going to come forward and corroborate this, or several people are going to come forward and say, no, this is not true. Um, there is a letter that was published overnight by some 90 people in the national security community who asked that the whistleblower's identity be protected. You have a different take on this. It's not that you don't want the identity protected, but you think the initial whistleblower, for his or her own sake, should come forward and go public. Why? Yes, I do. Uh, ordinarily, I would agree that whistleblowers should remain anonymous. However, this is an unprecedented case. And I believe that the whistleblowers, in this case, two whistleblowers, the donates are eventually going to be leaked. And I believe the whistleblowers would be better served and better protected if they came forward and, and gave their narrative, told their side of the story. And the reason for that is I believe the, the American people are phenomenal arbiters. Uh, they can determine who's telling the truth, who's looking out for the country. And so if these whistleblowers were to come forward and to tell their story, uh, the American people would weigh in and determine whether or not what they were saying was, was true. What's this person going through? right now. You've been there to a certain extent, so explain that to us. Yeah, my advice to these whistleblowers would be the, the present you um, is probably very scared and very, uh, very frightened. However, the, the future you is going to thank you um, for what you've done, showing the strength of courage. Um, I can promise you that you're going to be blessed with peace of mind. You're going to sleep soundly at night after all this is done. Um, and so that would be what I would offer to these, these whistleblowers, is to, to stay strong. The initial whistleblower has come under criticism from the president himself, basically questioning the patriotism of this person. What do you make of that? I, I can't comment on the, the, the president directly, um, given my ongoing, mil ongoing military duties. But what I say, what the, anybody should be doing when they're confronting a whistleblower is simply to refute the whistleblower's allegations with facts. Um, you can falsify the allegations. You can um, simply come out with your own facts to dispute that. And that's, this is, that is how this should be played out. There should never be personal attacks involved in any of this. Um, the attorney for the whistleblower, Mark Zaid, was also your attorney, if I'm correct. And this attorney's motives have been called into question, calling him some kind of a democratic operative. Based on your experiences, how do you refute those claims? Yeah, that is uh, completely untrue. I, I know Mark. Um, the allegation that Mark's a political operative or a partisan or pursuing a partisan agenda is, is categorically false. Um, I hired Mark because he's considered a top lawyer in national security and in the intelligence community. Um, I know he's very well connected in Washington, D.C., and I know that he worked constructively with both Republicans and Democrats, and that's why I hired him. I, didn't, I wasn't going to hire a political hack. I was going to hire somebody that could win for me. And, and going back to your first answer, when you first saw the initial complaint, you said, number one, very well written. Number two, very connected. Explain to me what you mean by that. Yes. Well, in this complaint, they talked about officials, uh, high-level officials. So this wasn't somebody hiding out in the, the corner cubicle, um, you know, siphoning off information. This was somebody that was obviously out there socializing with people in leadership positions, um, putting together this complaint. And so that was immediately apparent to me as soon as I read this. All right. Uh, Bradley Poliska, again, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for sharing your own experience and how it relates to what these now at least two people might be going through this morning. And a former ambassador to NATO. We should also note that Mr. Burns is also a foreign policy advisor to Joe Biden's 2020 campaign. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Let me begin by getting your reaction to this developing news overnight that the U.S. is pulling out its remaining 1,000 forces from northern Syria. Well, this is a very serious mistake by President Trump because the Syrian Kurds have been our closest ally. 
uh, in Syria over many years. They've been protecting the U.S. troops there. They're also the most significant help to us in defeating the Islamic State. And they've held the ground in northern Syria and prevented the Syrian government, Russia and, and Iran from occupying it. So they had a very strategic role. They played uh, they played into American interests and they helped us achieve our interests there and suddenly the president decided on a Sunday evening to withdraw them without informing France and Britain, our two allies who are there with us. So this is a major mistake. It's going to have consequences for us because the credibility and word of the United States will be in question that we don't stand by our friends who have stood by us. Our friends, that being the Kurds, uh, you mentioned that uh, our allies there, our European allies were not informed the Kurds weren't informed either. I want to read you a tweet from the spokesperson for the Syrian Democratic Forces, and he tweeted this. We are not expecting the U.S. to protect northeast, northern Syria, but people here are owed an explanation regarding security, mechanism deal, destruction of fortifications, and failure of U.S. to fulfill their commitments. What does this mean going forward for our allies, the Kurds, and their plight? It put... It puts them in a great jeopardy in northern Syria. They're going to be defenseless now. The Turks want to carve a 30-kilometer zone from their border into northern Syria and control it. The Turks, as you know, consider the Syrian Kurds uh, to be terrorists. We disagree with them. And for years, the United States in the Bush and Obama administrations and into this administration have felt that we need to protect them because they've been protecting us. And you remember that Secretary Jim Mattis resigned in large part. Mm -hmm because of the president's decision uh, a year ago to abandon the Kurds. Um, he we thought he was talked out of that, but now after a phone call with President Erdogan yesterday on Sunday, the president has changed course again. And, and the message here to all of our friends in the Middle East is that the United States is unreliable. Some of the statements coming out of the Syrian Kurds this morning are that the United States has stabbed us in the back. And how does this help promote U.S. interests in any way, shape, or form? Because you keep hearing from military leaders who oppose this decision, saying that this benefits Russia, first and foremost, and Iran as well. That's exactly right. I mean, apparently, um, I think it's on good, me good, uh, good uh, evidence that the State Department and Defense Department oppose this decision by President Trump. The Syrian Kurds have been holding ISIS prisoners. They're helping us to prevent the return of the Islamic State. And so there'll be very serious consequences for the United States as okay. a result of this decision. This the and this wasn't the only uh, geopolitical development overnight. We're also hearing that the North Koreans are ruling out resumptions of what they call sickening talks with the United States. So where does that leave the U.S. with regards to our uh, intentions of moving those talks forward? I think it's clear by now that President Trump's uh, attempt to try to negotiate with Kim Jong-un have not succeeded. I think the president was right to try diplomacy a year and a half ago, but he's had three summits with Kim. There have been no results. In fact, the North Koreans haven't even started on the rudimentary aspects of these negotiations. They haven't declared to us where their nuclear facilities are. And there's a lot of evidence that the North Koreans are building up their nuclear weapons force and their conventional missile forces and they've been firing rockets uh, into the Sea of Japan and so it's time for the United States to go back to where we were and that's trying to lead a sanctions effort to make sanctions work and inflict some damage on the North Korean economy to get the attention of Kim Jong-un but to stick with this policy as the president appears determined to do is simply going to be fruitless it's not going to be in the security interests of the United States it hurts South Korea and Japan as well Yes, I was just going to say, it does nothing but hurt our allies in the regions there who have been opposing the developments of arms that we've seen lately out of North Korea. Quickly, while I have you here, I want to go back to Russia, because something caught my attention and all of our attention over the weekend uh, with revelations that the president, apparently in conversations with former become... Prime Minister of Britain, Theresa May, uh, displayed some skepticism uh, that Russians were behind the poisoning of Sergei Skripal, the, the former Russian spy. To that, the Russian uh, ministry in, in uh, the United Kingdom tweeted that story and wrote, this is the best evidence that no evidence of Russian involvement exists. This seems to once again benefit Vladimir Putin. By the way, today's his birthday, we should note. Well, it certainly does. I mean, here's President Trump not taking the word of the United Kingdom, our closest ally, that that the, the Russians launched this nerve agent attack 
inside the United Kingdom. It, it's, it, but it's, it's tantamount to what President Trump has done he, uh, here in the United States. He hasn't taken the word of our intelligence community that Russia hacked in, uh, the, the Democratic National Committee in 2016. The president is following this extraordinary story, which is false, that somehow the Ukrainians did it. That's at the source of his problems with Ukraine, uh, his request to President Zelensky, and now the House impeachment trial. The president has not stood up, not just for the United Kingdom, but for our CIA, our intelligence community, the State Department, the Pentagon. He's questioned all the agencies of his government, and he seems to take the word of Vladimir Putin. Putin. It's extraordinary that there isn't more outcry in the president's own party, right. in the Republican Party, against what he's doing. That does seem to be the common theme. Ambassador, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. John. Seems like almost every day is Vladimir Putin's birthday. <laughs> yes. All right, President Trump says that pushing Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden is all about rooting out corruption. So how hard is it to believe that this president is all of a sudden an anti-corruption crusader? John Avalon has a reality check. I think the answer might be very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I bet you didn't see this one coming, guys. I mean, Donald Trump trying to reframe his re-election around being an anti-corruption crusader. I don't care about Biden's campaign, but I do care about corruption. What I want to do, and I think I have an obligation to do it, probably a duty to do it, corruption. We are looking for corruption. Okay, that takes brass. I mean, this is a guy who's been called the most corrupt person ever to run for the presidency. A guy whose charitable foundation was shut down after an investigation by the New York Attorney General found that it was engaging in a, quote, shocking pattern of illegality the only president in decades to refuse to release his tax returns, with the Justice Department involved in the effort to make sure they stay secret, and the only president to refuse to divest themselves from their business interests, something 